Merry Christmas. I love saying it because I'm, I'm a curmudgeon. I don't say it until the Christmas season. Even yesterday after the 10 o'clock Mass, people are like, Merry Christmas, Father. I'm like, Merry Advent to you as well. Enjoy those, those four hours. But now we can say it, and we're going to say it again. So Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Oh, I love that because, you know, we can't say Christmas without who? Without Christ. So true. We've heard it before. We'll hear it again. Without Christ, there is no Christmas. And so we're able to say, right, that, that we're celebrating what? We're celebrating the, the Mass of Christ. So we can say it again, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Very good, very good, very good. Praise God. And what a great gift God gives himself to us. And we celebrate this, this, this great gift, the birth of Christ. The world, by the way, likes to celebrate Christmas. We, we see this with all the decorations. We see this with all the advertisements. We, we see this, as Deacon Michael has said, and I've said before, when we start playing Christmas music on Independence Day, we like to celebrate Christmas, but so often we try to take, we don't, but sometimes we take, well, the center of the stage, the, the sportsman's birthday out of it. We could take Christ out of it. And we can lose that, that true meaning of what Christmas is. You know, great theologians have, have spoken and written about Christmas. Great philosophers have as well. And today I want to kind of reference a couple of them. We'll get to that great theologian in a little bit. But I want to reference today to start off with a great philosopher. Now, he's a modern-day philosopher, and I didn't study him at University of St. Thomas as I majored in philosophy. But instead, I studied him probably as a three-year-old. His name is Dr. Seuss, and I believe that he truly is a great philosopher. I've referenced Dr. Seuss before in a Christmas homily, but we're doing a different one today. But about eight years ago, I'm sure you remember, because I didn't, I have to look back in my notes, I referenced the book uh, Green Eggs and Ham. So if you want to look that up, go back on YouTube, it's there. But today, we're going to reference a different book by Dr. Seuss, and that, of course, is The Grinch. Now, we're probably familiar with the story of the Grinch. Maybe we're even familiar with the Hollywood version of Jim Carrey. It was a great movie. I saw it in the movie theaters. The year 2000, I was a senior in high school, and it was the first time in high school I did not use a buffer zone sitting next to the person next to me because it was a girl, and I wanted to sit really close to her. But we're not going to reference that movie. Instead, we're going to reference the book because I think the book does a beautiful job of explaining what actually happened with the Grinch. Now we know the story. We know that all of the Whovilles like Christmas a lot, except for who? Well, the Grinch, who lived just north of the Whoville, did not. Living up there on Mount Crumpet, and he got so upset hearing the singing, seeing this joy, them enjoying what? Their, their who pudding and their who roast beef. Oh, and the songs and songs drove him nuts. And so he decided to have an awful idea. And that awful idea was he was going to steal Christmas. So he's going to dress up as Santa Claus. And we know for, in order for that to happen, he needed to have a reindeer. And so he took Max, and he put some antlers on his head. And sure enough, he was able to go down into Whoville and to try to steal Christmas. He goes in there, and he's stealing everything. And of course, Cindy Lou shows up to get that cold drink of water. But the Grinch is a smart old Grinch, a sly Grinch as well, and one that is not afraid to lie. And so he says, I'm just fixing the bulb on this Christmas tree. I'll bring it back later. And inside you can tell that he's smiling. I'm stealing Christmas from you. And so he succeeds in stealing all of their presents, stealing all of their food, even the log off the fire. What an evil old Grinch he was. But why did he do this? Because his heart was closed. And so he takes everything. And he's going back up Mount Crumpet. And he wants to hear what? He wants to hear the who's cry out, boo who. Maybe that's where you get the word boo from, by the way. Like yesterday watching the Vikings, booing and hooing <laughs> as well. And so he said, that's a noise, grinned the Grinch, that I simply must hear. So he paused. Now the Grinch put his hand to his ear. And he did hear a sound rising over the snow. It started in low, then it started to grow. But the sound wasn't sad. Why, the sound sounded merry. It couldn't be so, but it was merry, very. He stared down at Whoville. 
the Grinch popped his eyes. Then he shook when he saw was a shocking surprise. Every who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, was singing without any presence at all. He hadn't stopped Christmas from coming. It came. Somehow or other, it came just the same. And the Grinch, with his Grinch feet ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. And he paused three hours till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. And I love this next line. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. And how true that is, that Christmas doesn't come from a store. It doesn't come from decorations. It doesn't come from roast beef. It doesn't even come from family. Christmas comes from who? Christmas comes from Christ. This is the gift, the gift that we celebrate. And I love this line as well because it causes the Grinch to ponder. Like every philosopher does, and every one of us should as well, to have our puzzler be puzzling sometimes with that question we ask all the time. There has to be what? There has to be something more. This is a question that we all grab, grip in our life, that we puzzle about. Isn't there something more? Of course, we know the answer is yes. The answer is who? The answer is Christ. He is all that we long for. He is all that we desire. You know, our world right now is facing a crisis. We look over and over again at all the news articles coming out and everything else, and how we are more and more unhappy. We're not fulfilled. We are longing for something more. It's that line, right? We've never been so connected by technology and so disconnected to one another. And we realize there has to be something more. There's more than, than, than presence. There's more than, than food. There's more than just our, our job. There's more than what the world has to offer here. And that is who? That is Jesus Christ. He is the answer to all of our desires. We go back to that great theologian, St. Augustine. And I've referenced him before, by the way, but St. Augustine lived in the fourth century. He lived a life full of just worldly pleasure, seeking out all that the world had to offer, but he wasn't fulfilled. He still had great desires. And finally, he came back into the Catholic faith. After that beautiful intercession of his mother, St. Monica, and he comes back. St. Ambrose helps him along the way. And he has this great conversion and this beautiful line, my soul is restless until it rests in me. My brothers and sisters, we know this to be true. Our soul will be restless until it rests in God. And God knows this. Why? Because he is the one who created us. He created us in his image and in his likeness. And so if we try to find our fulfillment outside of him, we're not going to have our fulfillment. This is how we are created and in God's infinite wisdom that he is the fulfillment to our desires, that he is the answer to all that we long for. That question of there must be something more and what the world has to offer is true. And we know that answer is Jesus Christ. You know, this past year I had the opportunity to, 
to go to a, just a talk, a random talk that the archdiocese put on that they require the priest to go to. I'll be honest, sometimes you're like, all right, mandatory attendance. I'm glad I'm still back in school. Hi, Archbishop. Good to see you. Check. You saw me. All right. Good to go. But it was a beautiful talk, and it was about, a, about uh, some small groups coming on in the archdiocese. And there was a, their, their main speaker, he was great. But the speaker, this priest from England, brought with a layperson, a lay teacher from, from England. Uh, she was a recent convert to the Catholic faith. And she only talked, I think, for four minutes. But you could tell when she started to talk that she was convicted of what she was saying and that she was speaking the truth. And she just spoke from the heart. And she's someone who experienced, just like St. Augustine, what the world had to offer. And it wasn't fulfilling her. And she only had her fulfillment until she came into the Catholic faith. And so she challenged us priests in a beautiful way. She said, you need to know this truth. The truth that God loves you. And that God is the answer to all of your problems. And so is the Catholic Church. This, all of your answers are here. All the questions you have can be fulfilled and answered through Jesus and the Catholic Church. Recently, I came across a song by uh, another great uh, Catholic out there. His name is Brother Isaiah. He's a, he's a songwriter. Maybe you've heard of him before. And I just recently came across him a couple weeks ago. But one of his, his songs is called Tender Remedy. And he speaks this lyric, which is just so beautiful. He goes, talking about God. You are the answer to all of the world's problems and you are the answer to all of my drama. I love that line, right? You are the answer to all the world's problems and all of my drama. And my brothers and sisters, we have plenty of drama, right? We know Christmas time can be that way sometimes. But that he is the answer. And this is the truth. And this is what we celebrate today. That he is the one who is able to transform us. We go back to the story of the Grinch, by the way. After he's puzzled this and he's realized that Christmas must be something more, he says, what? And what happened then? Well, in Whoville they say that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. So when we come, when we come here to Mass, what are we able to do? Our heart is able to grow because the sacred heart of Jesus gives himself to you and to me. He gives himself to us, how? Well, he humbles himself so that we may share in his divinity, that we are able to receive him in the Eucharist and to share in his divinity and so that he truly can transform us, so that he can truly love us and give us all that we desire. So my brothers and sisters, we come here not only today, but every day of our life, we come before the Lord and say, Lord, you are all that I long for. And I give you permission to expand my heart, to transform me, because I know that you are what? That you are the answer to all of the world's problems, and that you are the answer to all of my drama.